Okay. Amen. Well, welcome to Palm Sunday, and um, I don't know why they put the Easter season in March this year. I feel like it's really weird, um, but, but it's pretty cool because Palm Sunday is actually Caleb Terrell birthday Sunday, so happy birthday to him. Happy. He's not even in the room. He quit already. He knew it was coming. He's gone, baby. Uh, happy birthday to our worship director. Um, we... Uh, we, we we're just so grateful for him. But anyways, <laughs> this isn't about Caleb. This is about Jesus. Um, happy Palm Sunday. You know, this day represents the day that our Lord Jesus rode in to Jerusalem, rode in for his triumphant entry into Jerusalem. Um, so turn your Bibles to John chapter 12. John chapter 12. Um, and if you can't get there in 15 seconds, uh, I'm just going to go on without you. So it's a race. It's a race. No, I'm kidding. We'll have it on the screen. Everybody's like, really? Well, that seems legalistic. No. Palm Sunday, it commemorates the day of our Lord when he rode into the city of Jerusalem, hailed as the Lord of salvation and King of Israel. And I hear papers still going, so I'll give you more time. I really ain't that mad. I'll give you some more time because I got some more context to give you what we see during this scene, this picture of Palm Sunday is really a picture of a few important things that, a few important principles that we really need to look at. Number one, we see Jesus's fulfillment of prophecy. Who knows that we have a prophetic God and he doesn't just prophesy, but he fulfills the prophecies. They actually come to pass. Number two, we see Jesus's declaration of kingship. Jesus isn't just your homeboy. Jesus isn't just your friend. If he is your Lord and Savior, he is your king and should rule over your life. This is where Jesus first publicly declares that he is king of not just Israel, but the universe. And number three, Jesus, we see Jesus as a symbol of eternal peace. I, I sense today that a lot of people walked in and you need some actual lasting peace in your life today. And I pray when, you, when we get into the scripture, you can see that Jesus is the Prince of Peace. And this is what he declares at the beginning of this holy week that we are in, this, this week of passion that we're in. I really believe this is the most important week for the salvation of mankind. Can I get an amen? This is, this is the most important week of the salvation of mankind. This is how important it, in, it is. I want to I show you before I get into it. I'm giving you a lot of time to get there. So if you ain't there by the time we get there, um, I don't believe you ever read your Bible, and it's fine. No, I mean, just let's do better. Um, but I want to look at each gospel to show you how important the Holy Week, the week of passion, was to each writer. The book of Matthew, about 28.6% of the book of Matthew was about the Holy Week. Eight out of 28 chapters, Matthew decided to make about seven days. Isn't that wild? Seven days. It was about 28% of the book of Matthew. The book of Mark, about 37.5% of Mark's was about the week of passion. The book of Luke, about a quarter. You know, Luke's a really long gospel, but about a quarter, 25% of Luke's gospel is about this week. And John, where we're going to be at today, 42.9% of the book of John was about the last seven days of Jesus' earthly life. Can we agree today that this might be the most important week to Christians and mankind who are without a Savior? This is the most important week because the Scripture writers, the Holy Spirit, inspired them to focus this, this much of their time on it. Remember Paul said this in 1 Corinthians and if Christ has not been raised, our preaching is useless, and so is your faith. There's something about this Holy Week. Everything happens that was supposed to happen right here in this Holy Week that would guarantee the salvation of God's children that he felt like he lost. Everything is right here. And if Jesus didn't die and raise again, this whole thing would be pur purposeless, useless, Paul says. Like this preaching thing that I'm doing right here, it would just be motivational speaking. And I don't know if you know, the Bible actually says preaching is the only gift that has the opportunity to lead people into salvation. It's the preaching of the word, whether that's from a stage or whether that's in a prayer meeting or whether that's on the street. The proclamation of the word of God is the only thing that saves men, that the Holy Spirit rides on to save men. And Paul says it'd be pointless if this week was fake, if this week was inauthentic. If Jesus did not die and raise again, these would just be empty 
words. These will just be empty words. So again, I say this is the most important week that we have historically written down about in the Bible, in the Bible. And we have preachers out here preaching that are getting hundreds of thousands, if not millions of thousands, or millions of thousands, math, that math ain't mathin', millions of likes on Instagram and, and TikTok and all of the stuff. And I listen to their sermons, and they're, some of them are wrestling with the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus. It's just like, what are you preaching? If you don't believe that Jesus died and rose again, what are you preaching? And I say to them, take a seat. Sit down. Amen. You're not a preacher. Amen. You need to chill out. You need to figure out your head and heart really quick and uh, decide if you actually believe what Jesus said he was going to do and what he actually did by the Bible, the most historically accurate and studied book of all time. Like Pastor Mark said the other night, the best-selling book of all time still to this day. We need to start actually believing in it, but we got these pastors, they're literally leading congregations of thousands of people while they're deconstructing. Y'all have heard that word? Deconstructing their faith. Too many are deconstructing their faith while they're trying to lead. And all they're going to do is lead people to a devil's hell. It's like, sit down. I, I, I'm sorry, I got on a soapbox really quick. I don't, know, I, don't, I don't understand the idea of Christianity without the close-fisted belief that Jesus actually died and actually rose again. I don't understand these progressive Christians out there that just say, oh, you can believe what you want about Jesus. It's all, it's all about love. There's no truth. I don't understand it. It's either Jesus died and rose again, or he didn't, and we need to go home and sing Kumbaya and watch football. Like, that's, that's what it is. But I really believe that Jesus died. And I believe what I believe. I believe what I believe. We need to start believing what we believe. Stop, start doubting your doubts this morning, because we all have them. We all have them. But James, in the book of James, he says, you know, a man who doubts in the context indicates a man who is caught up in his doubt is like, is like, a, is like a wave that just goes to and fro, to and fro. He's not saying never have a doubt, but he's saying we need to doubt our doubts and believe what we actually believe. Amen? Amen. That was extra. Y'all, y'all got a little bit extra there. John chapter 12. Are we there? Amen. Hallelujah. John chapter 12. Let's go to verse 12. Hopefully that doesn't take too many, too much more uh, page turning. John 12, verse 12. It says, the next day, the large crowd that had come to the feast heard that Jesus was coming to Jerusalem. So they took branches of palm trees and went out to meet him, crying out, Hosanna! Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord, even the King of Israel. Verse 14, this is my favorite verse right here. And Jesus found a young donkey and sat on it. Like, that's just a gangster move right there, man. Jesus just walking down the street and is like, look at that young donkey right there. I just feel like I need to sit on it. Like, that's just, that's how my brain works. Like, I love that. And Jesus found a young donkey and sat on it, just as it is written. It's a little deeper than that. Just as it is written, verse 15. This is actually out of Jeremiah chapter 9, verse 9. Fear not, daughter of Zion. Behold, your king is coming, sitting on a donkey's colt. See, Jesus wasn't just chilling on a donkey. He knew that prophecy was unfolding in front of him. And what did he do? He sat on it. He decided to take it and receive it and go with it. Verse 16, his disciples did not understand these things at first. That gives me a little bit of comfort because <laughs> it's like every time I read the Bible, I'm like, I don't know. I don't understand that. I don't understand it at first, second, third, fourth, fifth. I don't understand it often the hundredth time I read it. So that gives me a lot of confidence that the disciples that walked with Jesus didn't totally understand it. But when Jesus was glorified, then they remembered these things that had been written. Somebody say written. Written. The written word is more than important. Amen. These things that have been written about him and had been done to him. The crowd that had been with him when he called Lazarus out of the tomb and raised him from the dead continued to bear witness. The reason why the crowd went to meet him was that they heard he had done this sign. He had heard that, they, that he found this donkey and sat on it. So the crowd's like, oh my gosh, 
because they could connect enough dots from the book of Zechariah, and they're like, we have to go see what's going on here on this day. This is happening. Verse 19, so the Pharisees said to one another, the religious Pharisees said to one another, you see that you are gaining nothing. The Pharisees, you see that we're gaining nothing. Look, the world has gone after him. I wish in 2024 that revival would so break out that we could see the world going after Jesus. And I believe by the power of God, that's not a pie in the sky dream. I believe that is reality. It says in the last days, the spirit of God will pour out his spirit on everybody, on men, women, boys, and girls, give old men dreams, young men visions. And it's just like, I believe that we can just, we can taste it here in this place today. So I don't believe that's like, oh, that'd be great. I believe that is literally the plan of Jesus, that the whole world would go after him because it was written right here. And that's where I'm going to talk from today. As it is written, as it is written, as it is written, Jesus was hailed as the King and the Lord of Israel on that day over 2,000 years ago. And it's awesome because historians, they're pretty sure they know the exact date on when this would have happened because, you know, we're in the Passion Week. You know, we're in the Passover Week, as the Jews would call it. So they know the exact day when this would happen. On the calendar, it would have been the 10th of the month of Nisan. I ain't talking about your Nissan Altima outside that is all beat up and raggedy. No, no. This is, this is when you look at the Jewish calendar, Nissan was a month. And this day, what we call Palm Sunday, would have been the 10th of Nissan. The 10th of Nissan. And actually, they know it was in AD 32 from all of these other historical things that have lined up, whether it's extra biblical writings that came out talking about Jesus or any, all these other things, even the scripture itself. The 10th of Nissan on AD 32. And actually, what that would reframe on our calendar is April 6th. AD 32. You should probably write that down. If if you're into dates, you should probably write that down. It's going to be important. April 6th, AD 32 was the literal date that this happened, that, that the scriptures wrote about thousands of years earlier. As it was written, this was the day it actually came to pass as it was written. That's why the crowds came and flocked around him, because this seems like prophecy unfolding. Um, has anybody in the, in the house today seen Dune Part 2? <laughs> okay, I see one hand. Okay, Wes. <laughs> Me and Wes saw Dune Part 2, which is pretty funny because we actually went and saw it together. <laughs> Sci-fi bros for life. We literally said that in the parking lot after the movie. <laughs> I'm not going to waste a lot of your time on this movie, but, but Dune is this, is this cautionary tale of human messiahs. <laughs> like, let's not worship humans that are not deity and aren't God because it can get out of hand and it can get dangerous. In the story, this, na- this boy named Paul was the chosen one to be the Messiah. And what I love about Dune Part 2, Paul was stepping into all of these hundreds and thousands of years of prophecies that religious people wrote down about the Messiah. And every time Paul stepped into a prophecy, one of the guys in the movie named Stilgar, he would go, oh, as it is written. <laughs> and um, he, every time it would happen, oh, as it is written, oh my gosh, the Moadi, he would do this and he would do this as it was written, as it is written, as it is written. And what would happen to Stilgar, he would get confidence every time the Messiah would fulfill something that was written in Scripture. And he'd be like, as it was written, as it was written, it happened. Oh my goodness, as it was written, it would happen. And I want to take this as an illustration to to point at a problem today. We have so much opportunity in this written word to see as it was written, what was written down thousands of years ago. And we have every opportunity in your everyday life to go, oh my gosh, that just happened as it was written, as it was written. I woke up and this happened today as it was written. Oh my gosh, I went into a dark place today and I treaded on serpents and I made it out alive as it was written. Oh my gosh, I went to the altar and laid hands on somebody and they were healed as it was written they would be. 
Oh my gosh, I got saved and I feel brand new. As it was written, I asked for the Holy Spirit to baptize me and change me. And oh my gosh, as it was written. We, ha- we as modern day Christians, we, 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 uh, we just do not value the as it was written stuff anymore. We don't value the as it was written stuff. We believe, we believe it at first when, it's, when we receive it. Like I, you, a lot of you are going to believe today. When I tell you a truth, you're going to receive it. You're going to believe it when you receive it because you feel it. We feel it. But as soon as the enemy comes in and tells us the opposite, what do we start doing? We start doubting. We start doubting and we believe what we doubt. Can anybody identify with that? You don't have to raise your hand on that, but like, I'm going to raise my hand. When I start doubting something and the more I doubt it, the more I believe the doubt, then all of a sudden the as it was written disappears in my mind. Isn't it logical that the father of lies would only communicate the opposite of what Jesus came with, grace and truth? Jesus came only with grace and truth, John says. Wouldn't it be logical that the father of lies, the enemy of your soul, Satan, would only communicate lies to you that are the opposite of the truth? So when God gives you a promise that your cancer will be healed, the enemy will come in with the opposite. Finances will be okay. God gives you a promise. Finances will be okay. Marriage will be restored. You'll get into that school. You'll get that job. Your ministry calling will come to pass. Why are you shocked within 30 days, 30 hours, or 30 minutes? All of a sudden, you feel the opposite because the father of lies sees the promise of God on your life, and he wants you to start doubting it because if he can get you to doubt it, he can get you to walk away from the promise that you're ready to receive. He'll say, nuh-uh, nuh Did God really say? Remember that in the book of Genesis? Did God really say? Satan has no, tri- no new tricks. Did God really say? Then we so easily walk away from, from the scripture and even the personal revelation that is held up by the word of God, and we don't believe it anymore. We doubt it because Satan lied, and we felt it. We felt it. We felt it. It's not about a feeling today. It's not about a feeling tomorrow, my friends. It's about faith. It's about faith. It's not about a feeling. It's about faith. So we need to stop so easily walking away from the faith in God that we once felt. And just because we don't feel that and we feel the work of the enemy a little bit more, feeling should not indicate where your belief should lie. It shouldn't. It shouldn't. It's not about a feeling today. It's, a, it's about faith that leads to hope, that, that leads to trust in the proven prophetic promises that God has for you in this holy scripture. And today I want to walk through this scripture and I'm going to give you three things. I'm going to give you three things that happen if you believe in the promise. Does that sound okay? Do you want to know three things that will happen if you believe in the promise? We start off this scene with Jesus walking into Jerusalem where Jesus, he absolutely knew what he was walking into. He was the son of God three and a half years into this ministry. He knew. Remember so many times Jesus would say, it's not my time yet. It's not yet my time. Don't do that. Don't talk about me. He knew that this day was the actual day. In Matthew 21, we see this happen. It's a parallel to the story in John 12. We see this happen in Matthew 21. Now when they drew near to Jerusalem and came to Bethpage, to the Mount of Olives, then Jesus sent two disciples, saying to them, Go into the village in front of you, and immediately you will find a donkey tied and a colt with her. Untie them and bring them to me. If anyone says anything to you, you shall say, The Lord needs them, and he will send them at once. What a wild story of confidence that Jesus has. And we should be that confident. I'm not saying you can go out and boost somebody's car after church. That's not what I'm saying. Like the Lord owns it all, so he can do that with his. But this confidence that, that Jesus have, that has, we constantly see this in the life of Jesus, that he actually, he really believes what his mother, what his stepfather Joseph, what his heavenly father told him about himself. Jesus actually believes it. And he looks at the Pharisees in this story and non-believers. He looks at them dead in the eyes and says, I'm only doing what I hear my father telling me to do and what I see him doing. He has this confidence 
that his purpose is being played out in front of everybody. If you actually read on in John chapter 12, you will see that in the landing spot of this story. Jesus will look at the Pharisees and be like, I'm just doing what the Father has told me to do. I know who I am. I don't care who you say I am. Devil, I don't care who you say I am. I don't care at all. I know who the Father has made me to be. Jesus did not struggle with belief. He knew belief was the doorway to benefits. Like you see in the, in the book of Psalms, God's benefits. He knew that, that belief was the doorway to the blessings of God. And faith is the portal to fulfillment. Do you have faith this morning? Do you got faith this morning? That's your only way into fulfillment. Paul said in Galatians 3, so those who rely on faith are blessed along with Abraham, the man of faith. If you want blessings, you got to act on faith. If you want to live the blessed life, you have to live a faith-filled life to be fulfilled. And you will start to experience what you hold close and love and believe is true. You will start to experience those things that, that, that you're hoping for and loving on and, and, and just like you got a promise for. God gave me a promise and you will start to see them in your life and you will want to sit on them. You will want to hold them close. When me and Kayla, shoot, 11 years ago, got our first adult car. What a process, by the way, and what a joke. <laughs> like, hey, Get your first job and, you know, go, go 30 grand in debt or 20 grand in debt. That's a good idea. You're an adult now. Get a nice car. You know, we had our first adult car. It was just like we were so excited about it, though. It, 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 it was special. It was unique. It was like never seen before. You know, it was like this cardinal red Chevy Cruze, but it was the LT, the LT something, LT1. It was the LT1, dude. And we were really excited about it, and we really liked it, you know, like 20-inch rims. It just looked really nice, you know. We want to look nice as humans, and I won't commentate on that, but that's just, we were just, we really enjoyed it. And um, like all of you that have experienced getting a new car, whether it was new to you or brand new, you start driving down the road feeling like, dude, I'm special in this thing. And then it's just like on the highway, zoom, there goes another, you know, crimson red Chevy Cruze LT1 with the 20-inch rims. Like, oh, oh, must be an anomaly. <laughs> you know what I mean? Scientists couldn't even explain that. Like, we're the only two. We got to be the only two in the state of Missouri. And then it's just like, you know, you go to church, and it's just like people in your church all of a sudden have the same exact car. You go through McDonald's, and you're behind one, and there's one behind you, and it's just like they're, they're just everywhere. They're everywhere. It's like people pull up to your driveway. It's like the Amazon Prime gal gets out of a, you know, a maroon red Chevy Cruze, and you're just like, I thought I was special. I thought I was special. I thought I was unique. You know, this phenomenon isn't new. It's what happens when we start to care about something. When we get something in our life, we start to care about it because we own it. We believe in it. We see it everywhere. Here's number one if you're taking notes. Here's number one, if you believe in the promise, you will one day see it everywhere. And this is a good thing. If you believe in the promise that God has given you, you will start to see it everywhere. If you don't believe in the prophetic promises in your life right now, it's because of a couple possible reasons. Number one, you simply don't believe in God. And you need to repent of your sins today turn away from them, turn to Jesus, make him Lord and King over your whole life so you can actually unlock some of the blessings in your life. So if you're struggling to even believe in anything, any promise for your life, you need to believe in God. Can I get a believer to say amen on that? Amen. Okay, we're wait, cool. Uh, believe in God, day of salvation. Or number two, you believe enough to be saved, but you don't believe enough to be blessed. I say that's a lot of us in this room. Y'all believed enough to get saved, but you don't believe enough to be blessed. That's a whole different situation there. God can save your eternal soul, and you can live like hell on earth. Do you believe enough to be blessed? This is a lot of our problems. You might say you believe the Bible, but do you actually know what it says? Oh, I'm a Bible-believing Christian. Okay, turn to the book of John. How long does it take? <laughs> it's like... Do you believe? Do you actually know what's inside of here? Bonus number three. <laughs> 
There might be a third reason. You actually know what the Bible says, but you, you've heard so many of the words of Satan more than you hear the words of the Lord. So you might believe in the Bible, but you have made the lies your enemy and your idol, and now the devil is your Lord. I believe in the Bible, but I listen to the devil. And that could be a lot of us here in this moment today. I come and hear a sermon on Sunday for about an hour long. But the rest of the week, 167 hours, I am worshiping at the feet of the enemy. I'm complaining all week long. That's worshiping the wrong kingdom. I'm complaining about all the bad things. I am saying, why can't I get over this hump? I'll never get healed. I'll never get saved. I'll never get delivered. I'll never, I'll never, I'll never. I believe in the Bible, though. Do you, though? What are you listening to all week long? The promises of God or the lies of the enemy? And it's easy to tell. Are you doubting or are you believing? I'm here to tell you today out of the words of Scripture, for no matter how many promises God has made, they are yes in Christ. And so through Him, the amen is spoken to us by the glory of God. That's 2 Corinthians chapter 2. So if every promise is yes in amen, why are we saying no? And uh-uh, to God. Huh? God, I believe every promise is yes and amen. Then why every corner are you turning and saying no to God in disobedience? It's time to start believing the Word of God for your life today. It's time to start believing what God has actually said in these words today. In the Word of God in John chapter 12, in verse 14, we see Jesus not just sit on his donkey or not just wait on his donkey to even show up. It says that Jesus found it. And we see in Matthew 21 where Jesus actually said, hey, it's going to be over there, disciples, go and get it. That's called delegation. <laughs> like, go and get my blessing for me. I want to be so spirit-filled where I'm just like, y'all, I need my blessing. Who's going to get it for me? You know what I'm saying? It's just like, where is my blessing? Jesus is like, it's prophesied, it's going to happen, but I got to go get it. I got to go get it. It's not just going to fall in my lap. He found the donkey, and he sat on it. He found the donkey, and he sat on it. And that phrase, Jesus found the donkey and sat on it, like I said in my introduction remarks, like, that's messed with me all week. Like, Jesus found his donkey and sat on it. Have you even looked for your donkey yet? And it sounds wild. It sounds wild. Have you looked for your donkey yet? Like, why would I look for a donkey? Why would I look for a donkey? Are you looking for peace? When a king rode in on a donkey, it was to signify that it's time for peace. King, kings come in on a horse when it's wartime. Jesus, when he's coming back for his second return, he's coming back on a horse to defeat sin, hell, and death once and for all. But, but when he came to planet earth, it was for the peace and salvation of mankind. But he had to find his donkey to usher in peace. You need to find your donkey this morning. The donkey didn't, doesn't find you. He ain't going to find you. There's even, there's Balaam. Remember Balaam the donkey? Bro, if you don't find your donkey, your donkey going to preach for you. (laughs) If you stink at preaching, if you're not preaching the word of God, if you're not prophesying the word of God, your donkey is going to do it for you and get the blessing. An animal, an animal, you know what I'm saying? One that you'd see in a petting zoo is going to stand up. It says even the rocks will cry out if the sons of God won't worship God. All of creation is groaning right now for the sons of God to stand up in their promise. That's what we have to do, but we have to go after it. And that's modeled by the Son of God becoming the Son of Man and going after his donkey. In verse 15 quotes the prophet Zechariah, do not be afraid, daughter Zion. See, your king is coming, sitting on a donkey's colt. He knew that he knew he was king before he ever had a crown on his head. He knew it. Do you know you're a son or daughter of God, even if it doesn't look that way on planet Earth? Even when you walk into your workplace and people are talking down on you, do you know that the Father's looking up? Like, do you know that? Jesus knew he was king without a crown. The promise didn't find the prophet. I'm a prophet of God. The promises are just going to keep coming on me. No, the prophet of God went out and found the promise. Because God prophesied into his heart. God wants to prophesy into your heart your promises for you and yours. And you have the responsibility to go after them, to go after them. And Jesus totally trusted the Father, the promise giver. 
He trusted that the Father was the promise keeper. Amen? Do you trust that God is the promise keeper this morning? I know a lot of you feel like you've been given a lot of promises and you have not received a lot of promises. Have you went after them? God bless his soul. I really feel for him right now because he was a hero of mine growing up in the music space. Kanye West is just falling apart right now. And he's blaming Jesus. He says, I got a problem with Jesus. I prayed for a lot and I didn't get a lot. And it's just like, well, if you think Jesus is this blue genie in a bottle that you can rub three times and get three wishes, you got it mistaken. He is king of the universe. Just like Kanye, you prophesied years ago when you put out Jesus is king. We so quickly forget the kingship of Jesus that he doesn't work for us. We work for him. So I'm praying for Kanye to come back to the salvation of Jesus, but I'm praying for all of us because we're in the same boat most days, whether we get on TMZ, whether we get on Instagram and tell everybody or not. Most of us, most of the time, me included, are doubting God and not submitting to his kingship as a promise giver, but he's a promise keeper, and he requires us to go and get the promise. He makes the promise. He materializes the promise. He, he, he puts it all together for us to go and get, call it out, go and get it. I ain't about all of the name and claim it stuff, but I, I sure love the phrase name it, claim it. Because when God puts a, puts a name of a promise in my heart, it's my job to claim it. It is absolute. I didn't get no amens on that. Bro, like, okay, okay. <laughs> sorry, if I, sorry if I didn't hear you. Pray for my healing in the name of Jesus. Like, let's go. But I, I'm into that phrase because if God gives me something to name it, I'm going to claim it because that's what he died for and that's what he paid for. He's a promise keeper. During this Easter season, and I don't want to put pressure on her because I don't know what her plans are this year, but my, my, my mother-in-law, Tammy Trump, is what we like to call her. I'm sorry if that's embarrassing. She's just the boss. <laughs> She's just the boss back there on the back row. She's just bossing. Uh, every Easter for the past few years, you know, she'd do an Easter egg hunt for all the grandkids, and uh, she would let all the kids have our own Easter egg hunt. And the beautiful thing about it is beforehand, she says, okay. I put some money in the Easter eggs. And you can imagine all of these adult children being like, okay, yes and amen. (laughs) Like, I'm going to go receive what's promised to me. And she's like, they're in there. There's this many fives. There's this many tens. There's this many twenties. There's even hundred dollar bills. I said, Tammy Trump, I'm sorry. I'm embarrassing her. (laughs) I assume that's too far, John. I can't take it back though. I already said it. There's all of these things out there. You guys just got to go get them. And you should see these Lansdowne girls, bro. Just like they're running, throwing elbows. They're knocking over husbands that are trying to help them. Like, Hey, I'm on your team. We live together for goodness sake. I'm trying to get it for us. She's like, I'm going to to get it. And anyways, at the end of the whole Easter egg extravaganza, we have all these Easter eggs. You know, there's the Laffy Taffies. Like, I'm throwing the Laffy Taffies out. I'm throwing the Skittles out, even though they're my favorite, but I'm after what I'm promised. I can go get Skittles at Dollar General whenever I want, and best believe, I do. <laughs> but it's like that money, though, that, that promise that, that Tammy has promised all these kids, they're in there. They're in there. The first year, wasn't quite sure if she was lying or not. That's not in her character, so I gave her trust. And that first year, we got them, and there was money in there. And everybody walked home with a little bit more money in their pocket. So I'm like, whoa, that's real. So year two rolls around. I'm like, I trust her. I, I, I am going hard at this. Yeah, I put a T on hard. I, I'm going hard. It's for the logo. And I'm going so hard at this because, because she promised and she came through on her promise. It's up to me to go get him. It's up to me go and crack those eggs open and find out where the promise actually is. If you're not receiving the promise of God, it's because you're not seeking it out. Number two, if you believe in the promise, your eyes will be searching for it and you will find it. This isn't like hide and go seek. God isn't hiding stuff for you not to find it. He is hiding it so that only you will find it. You know what I'm saying? It's like when you hide something in your room, like this is, I just know where this is. My kid's not going to find it. I am going to find it. God is doing that for you. He's putting your promise in a specific location for you to seek it out. So why do a lot of us, we don't carry that trust into our spiritual life? We say the stuff like, I'll never be healed. 
I believe it on a Sunday. I come down and pray for it, and I didn't receive it. It's like, I'll never be healed. I'll never see my family saved. I will never get out of debt. I'll never feel happy. I'll always be this depressed and anxious and suicidal. It's like, I thought we were people of God. Like, I, I didn't think we were, I thought we were people of faith. I didn't think we were people of feelings. Like, say what now? You'll never get your healing. You'll never get your promotion. You'll never get your promise that God, ha- you'll never do what? We have to start doubting those doubts. I'm going to keep saying that phrase until I'm done today. We have to keep on doubting our doubts. Satan is always telling you lies. It's time you stood up and said, say what, devil? Who are you? Says you? You know how he says, is that what God says? Who cares? That's what you say, devil? I don't care what you say. Get behind me, Beelzebub. The Lord of the flies? Like, get behind me, Satan. The Lord of the flies. Maybe that's why you feel so annoyed. Like when I ask people to raise their hands to get saved, maybe that's why you feel so annoyed because the devil's telling you you don't need to get saved and it feels like flies buzzing around your brain. Maybe that's why you feel so annoyed when somebody gives up, comes up here and gives a word of knowledge that hits you right in the soul, like that's for me, but you feel so like, like, like the bees are buzzing, the flies are buzzing, the devil is in your brain just buzzing, buzzing around. Maybe that's why you feel so annoyed because you've given over your mind and your heart, will, and emotions, your whole soul to the devil, but you're a Christian because you believe that you're living inside of a whole thing of lies. It's time to stand up and say, devil, get behind me. Get behind me. Get behind me. I'm tired of the enemy thinking that he can kill revival at real love. I'm tired of it. Like I, I'm tired of it, and I, I, I'm not going to let him. If it's just me standing up here alone, I'm not going to let him. To the day I die, he's not going to win. Not in this house, not in this city, not in this region, not anywhere that I can travel to. The devil's not going to win if I have anything to do about it. I'm sick of it. I'm tired. (laughs) I'm tired of, I'm just tired of the noise and the buzz of the enemy Like sometimes I see it in you. I see it in me too, but I can't see me unless I'm looking in a mirror. But sometimes I see it in you when you need to get saved. Well, John, I've been coming to church for nine years. You never got saved. Well, John, I've been tithing my whole time. It doesn't mean you're saved. Just because you're financially responsible and frugal. Well, John, I serve on the serve team. Yeah, it doesn't mean you're saved. John, I joined membership. We We see plenty of people saved after that. I'm sick of having to, I feel like I got to swat flies away from you when I know what you're dealing with physically and mentally and emotionally, and somebody says, hey, there's deliverance for you today, and you're just like, it's the enemy controlling your thought process in your mind. Your whole mindset is controlled by the enemy. God is saying, here's the promise, and the devil's saying, uh-uh, no, no, that's not for you, and that's, that's, that's not for you, and you can't even make a decision because you keep just looping the playback of the lies in your mind. If that is you today, you need to break free in the name of Jesus this morning and receive the promise. When you hear the promise, receive it. Before you hear it, call it out, declare it, and claim it. Go after what God has promised you. I'm at a place where I I don't even pray anymore like, God, get the devil out of my head. I don't pray that. Like, the devil can sow doubt all day long, and it shouldn't bother us. The devil can sow doubt into your mind all day long, and it's your choice to agree with it or not. When the devil sows doubt into my head, my gut reaction is, okay, what's the truth say? What's, what's the truth say? What's, what's the Bible say about that? Interesting take, devil. I'm guessing it's a lie because of your nature and character. What's the actual truth say right here, because I want to believe in the promises of God and in the Word. I want to believe what the Holy Spirit says to me. I want to believe. I want to believe. Remember in in Mark chapter 9, the demon-possessed boy's father, he said, Jesus, I believe. 
Help my unbelief. That's Christianity, y'all. That's chasing after the promises that don't feel tangible in the physical realm. Oh, I believe it even when the world, even when Satan, even when my selfish desires is telling me to not believe it. I believe it. God, help my unbelief. And guess what? He absolutely will because the promise is there waiting for you. God, I believe. Help my unbelief. And Jesus looked at that demon-possessed boy, and he didn't pray for him for five hours. He didn't get down on the ground weeping. He looked at the boy and said, leave him. And the demons had to leave him. The father said, I believe, help my unbelief. Jesus like, oh, you believe, you believe. I will help your unbelief by giving you the promise that I died for, giving you the promise that I set up for you. We have to start believing when it feels like we shouldn't. We have to start believing in the face of doubt. I actually believe this stuff. Some of you are so messed up with these words of knowledge, it just feels weird. Well, guess what is weird to me? When God gives you a word and you don't act on it. Well, I've never seen that before. I came up, I came up Presbyterian. I came up Luther. I I came up all of these different ways and I didn't see it before. Yeah, you haven't seen any miracles either. It's going to take something that looks a little different. It's going to take some people actually hearing from God and giving it out to the people. That's what a word of knowledge is. So I think it's weird. I think it's so weird when somebody has been bound up for decades and somebody says, oh, you can get released from all of your years of being bound up, and you're like, "Mm, not today. That's weird to me. Don't put your weirdness on me. Don't put your weirdness on leaders here. Don't put your weirdness on the Word of God when He is wanting to give you the promise. He died so you can receive it. And we do not, I do not, I don't realize with my little brain how deep the promise of the rabbit hole goes when it comes to Jesus, and this is how I'm going to end today, so stick with me a little longer. In verse 16, it says, at first the disciples didn't understand all this. I empathize. We don't understand things. Only after Jesus was glorified, after he resurrected, that they realized that these things had been written about him, and these things had been done to him. It's hard to, it's hard to remember. A lot of you have been given promises, But it's hard to remember how you got the promises when you are in the middle of it, right? When you're in the middle of your battle, it's hard to remember that feeling of confidence you got when you got the promise that you would get through it. And we all get stuck. We don't get stuck at belief. We get stuck in the middle where we're struggling to even remember how God did what he wanted to do. I want to read to you a prophecy. Please listen to this because this is important. A promise from the book of Daniel, Daniel chapter 9, verse 26. It's one verse that says, After the 62 sevens, the anointed one, the Messiah, will be put to death and have nothing. Some guy named Sir Robert Anderson, he was enamored with this prophecy and devoted his life to, and he wanted to figure out what this meant. And he wrote a whole book about it. He found with the whole context of Daniel in mind that the 62 sevens equaled 483 Jewish years. Uh, That's a time frame. So Daniel would say in 483 Jewish years, the Messiah will be put to death and have nothing. And Daniel prophesied in in the larger scope of his prophecy that the Jews would be allowed and commanded to go and restore outside of Babylonian captivity. They would be commanded to go restore Jerusalem and the temple one day. And we see that in the Bible, as it was written in the book of Nehemiah, where Nehemiah, you know, the king of Persia, Artaxerxes, the, the governor of Persia, the monarch of Persia, whatever you want to call him, say, hey, yeah, go back to Jerusalem, get it back up to speed. And Nehemiah and his buddies went and did that. And the day, the prophecy says, the day when the Persian king says that, 483 years from then, the Messiah is going to show up and tell Jerusalem that they're going to be destroyed again. I'm sorry if that doesn't feel like all warm and butterflies. That's not the point of this. I want to show you this prophecy in Daniel. Sir Robert, he got really like hardcore with the math. If I could say he got gangster with the math. He didn't use our modern calendar, our Julian calendar that we all use that uses 365 and a quarter days for each year. He used the Jewish calendar because ours didn't exist thousands of years ago. Are you with me? He used the Jewish calendar and 
how many days were in a year on a Jewish calendar? They went by the lunar cycle, not the solar cycle. 360. Say 360. 360. That's very interesting. I never even thought of that. 360 degree. 360. That's how many days are in a year in a Jewish calendar. Multiply that by 483. You get 173,880 days. And he came up with a date, but before I tell you that date, it's going to be a cliffhanger. And before I tell you that date, I want to read you out of Luke 19. Last scripture I'll read, maybe. Um, Luke 19. This is another parallel with, with Palm Sunday. Luke 19, 41. As he approached Jerusalem and saw the city, he, had, he Jesus, wept over it and said, if you even you had only known on this day, this day, what would bring you peace? But now it is hidden from your eyes. The days will come upon you when your enemies will build an embankment against you and encircle you and hem you in on every side. They will dash you to the ground, you and the children within the walls. They will not leave one stone on another because you did not recognize the time of God's coming to you. On that Palm Sunday, after declared the Messiah by the people, the anointed one by the people, the Christ by the people, Jesus stood up before his kingdom and said, you will be destroyed, everything. And we actually know that ended up happening several decades later. Jesus says, on this day that we've read about three different angles of, on this day, just like your prophet Daniel prophesied, I would tell you about your future destruction. And this day, if you wrote it down earlier, is April 6th, AD 32. The math, math's on it. As it was written, as it is written, your prophet Daniel, 483 years ago, said, this day would happen and you would know that I am king. You know, Jesus of Nazareth, he might not have been aware or even cared as the son of man about the actual date, but I got to believe that God, the Holy Spirit inside of him, led him to that day of destiny, led him to that date of destiny. You might not know the day that you're going to find your donkey. You might not know the day that you sit down on your promise. You just got to know that you're going to say yes to the Holy Spirit when he leads and prompts. The father promised and Jesus believed. And now we can see, if you look back in time, biblically speaking, now all of a sudden the disciples, after it was all said and done, could look back and say, oh, now I get it. I can look back on some of the promises God has given me and by the grace of God I've received. I can look back and see that season where I didn't really believe, but I just kept pushing and I didn't understand why bad things were happening, why evil things were happening to me and around me and all. I didn't understand, like, I didn't understand. And if if I would have looked even further back to when God gave me the promise, I could have started seeing all the evidence that God was going to come through. Just like if I could see Tammy in the next couple weeks just stuffing those Easter eggs with money, my faith would rise. What if you imagine the Father right now? now getting your promise ready, setting it in place, just like Jesus had to imagine, hey, the next town, my promise is there. Go get it for me. My donkey is there. Go get it for me. Tell them it's for the Lord and tell them, tell them, tell them. If you tell them it's for the Lord, they're going to give it to me because guess what? I am the Lord, says Jesus. Number three and last thing to write down, if you believe in the promise, the more you will see it in your past, believe it in your present and experience it in your future. God's promise is for you to receive it today. Hear me, God's promise is for you to receive it today. Just like that donkey was promised to Jesus, another gospel says that it was was an unbroken colt. Hear me, hear me, hear me, hear me. That it was an unbroken colt. No man ever rode that thing before because it was no man's promise. It was only Jesus' promise. Your promise is yours. Your promise is yours today. God has it specially designed and crafted for you to actually find and sit on. That means no other man can sit on what's yours. Jesus claimed it as his, told his disciples to tell the owners, it's okay, it's for the Lord. Some of you need to stand up from the lies of the enemy and sit on the throne of God. It's yours if you haven't seen it manifest yet. That might sound blasphemous to you, but that's what the Bible says. If God has promised it, it's as good as real. If God has promised it, it's as good as real. 
sit on it. Such a peculiar verse. He found his donkey and he sat on it. Find your promise and sit on it. If, you're ha- if you have doubts, people with doubts, pay attention. It's everybody. I see heads coming up. <laughs> I've got doubts. If you have doubts, <laughs> don't desaddle the promise to sit on the doubt. Sit on your promise. Sit on it and go, huh? God told me this. I'm going to sit on it. You understand the phrase? I'm going to sit on it. I'm going to wait on the promise. I'm not waiting on the doubts to see if the doubts are real. They're lies. We already know they're lies. I'm going to sit on the truth. I'm going to sit on it and think about it, how I believe what God said. Enemy, you can take your fiery dart. That's what the doubts are, fiery darts. Google it. It's in the Bible. (laughs) Maybe I should start saying like, I don't know, search your Bible dictionary instead of Google it. Chat GPT it. Fiery darts. Devil, you can take your fiery darts and sit on them. That's what I want to say to the devil someday. No, you can sit on your fiery darts. You remember when we were kids, liar, liar, pants on? That's where it came from. It's biblical. Enemy, you can take all those fiery darts you throw at me, and you can sit on those because I'm sitting on the truth of God. I'm sitting on the promises of God. I am sitting on the yeses and amens. I'm not going to sit on all the voices in my head that yell at me. I'm going to yell at them. It's like Eugene, he's just like, man, my number went up that one night, and I thought about the medication, but you know what? I'm actually going to believe what God told me to believe. I'm going to tell Satan to go back to hell where he came from. I'm sorry if you don't like that. This is where he came from. Let's go. I'm going to tell Satan to go back to where he came from, and I'm going to go to where God has me going to. That's the promise. I'm not going to sit on what the religious Pharisees mouth about me in our region. I'm I'm going to sit on the promise and vision that God has given me for the region of Southwest Missouri to be saved, starting in Seymour, starting in Webster County, Wright County, Douglas County. Green County. Give me a dang county, and I'm going to believe that revival will hit it in the name of Jesus. I don't care what the devil throws at me. I don't care what the devil tosses my way. I am going to believe in the promises of God. I'm going to sit on the promises. What you doing, John? I'm just sitting on it. I'm sitting on these promises. I am chilling. I'm hanging out on the promises of God. You really believe I'm that big? Well, today, yes, I do. Tomorrow, if you catch me and I'm in a down mood, I might not believe as big, but guess what I've decided to do? I'm going to sit on them. I'm going to believe. God, help my unbelief. I believe. Help my unbelief. And he said, he will come through like he always does. He will do the miracle like he always does. I'm going to sit on the promises. (laughs) I'm going to end on this. Do you want to hear some promises? Well, here's some promises. Here's some promises about Jesus in Scripture, to be born of a virgin. I was promised in the book of Isaiah, it's fulfilled in all the Gospels. Promised Jesus would be born in Bethlehem, prophesied in the book of Micah, fulfilled in the book of Luke, James, or not James, the book of all the Gospels. I'm just going to start saying all the Gospels. All this Jesus stuff is all the Gospels. It was promised in Zechariah, that, that he would come in triumphantly as hailed as Hosanna, and we see it in the Gospels fulfilled. It was prophesied that he would be betrayed for 30 pieces of silver in, in Zechariah, and it was fulfilled in the Gospels. It was prophesied in Isaiah that he would be the suffering servant, and it was fulfilled. It was prophesied that he would die, and it was fulfilled. It was prophesied that he would resurrect, and it was fulfilled. It was prophesied that he would ascend to be with the Father, and it was fulfilled. It was prophesied that he would pour out the Holy Spirit on all flesh that would believe in him, and it was fulfilled. Our Jesus was promised by the Word of God, and God sticks to His promises. He shows up and shows off. He does. It's promised. Okay, I'm not, I'm not done. Here's some promises about you, if you believe. John 3, 16, eternal life for whosoever believes promise of the Holy Spirit in John chapter 7, whoever believes in me, as Scripture has said, as it is written, rivers of living water will flow without them, through them, within them. 
resurrection and life in John chapter 14. Believers, you will become children of God, no longer orphans without a daddy. You will become children of God, we see in John chapter 1. Believers become children of God. I love this right here. Mark chapter 16. Now I might end with this whole section because this one fires me up. Believers will cast out demons. Believers will speak in new tongues. Believers will pick up snakes with their hands. Believers, if they drink deadly poison, it will not hurt them. It's weird. I don't care, but believers will place their hands on the sick and they will be healed. Those are some of the promises we have to sit on today. Those are some of the promises we actually have to start believing and keep believing no matter how we feel. Those are the things that we need to believe. And if you're struggling, doubt your doubt this morning. Doubt your doubt. I want you walking out of here today, doubting your doubt and believing what you believe. God, I believe, help my unbelief. God, I believe, help my unbelief. God, I believe, help my unbelief. Help me walk into places knowing that the promise is already here. Jesus, I declare you are Hosanna. We welcome you in this place. The God that saves and sets people free. I'm going to live like I actually believe it. I'm going to declare it like I actually believe it. I lied earlier, forgive me. Last scripture, Revelation 3.21, to the, who, to, to the one who is victorious, I will give the right to sit with me on my throne. Just as I was victorious and sat down with the Father on the throne. I don't know if you caught it. Jesus is promising you victory. I don't know if you feel it. I'm starting to feel it a little bit like I actually believe it, that Jesus hasn't set the church up for failure, but he set the church up for victory. In the church, she is going to be victorious. She is going to sit on the throne with Jesus Christ and the Father. The church is who Jesus died for to set up, to take over the literal world. I know one day there's going to be one world government and Antichrist is going to rise, but today I declare in this house, in this region, that the kingdom of God shall reign. And we're going to take it to the uttermost parts of the earth until Jesus decides it's time to come home. I actually believe what I'm saying right now, and I feel it. Do you believe it today, that Jesus is who he said he is, that he has promised you things? And he wants to be, the Bible says, he is a man of his word, and he will keep his promises. Over every sickness, he promises healing. I'm serious. Oh, John, you don't know how sick I am. I don't care. I don't care how sick you are. It said Lazarus was, this, was so sick that he died. Jesus didn't care how sick Lazarus was. Jesus walked up to the tomb four days later and said, Lazarus, what did he say? Come forth. Lazarus, come forth. I know you're sitting in this green chair. You look alive, but you realize that you're dead. Come forth today. Receive the blessing. Receive the miracle. There's no sickness that Jesus can't heal. There's no addiction that Jesus won't break free and land you into a place of not just recovery as a process, but recovered. The blood of the Lamb will cover you and recover you. I'm sorry if that flies in the face of your psychology and sociology. The Word says you will be made brand new by Jesus. Every demon that might be messing with you right now, even in this place, Jesus promises deliverance by his word. Jesus never got down with a demon and had this long conversation, you know, like we see in the screw tape letters between the, Jesus, he's king of all. He says, go and you have to go. He says, bow and you have to bow. Some of us re need to realize today you are an ambassador of Christ, no matter if you feel it or not. If you've accepted Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, he has labeled you as an ambassador so you can walk up to a demon and just say, go. 
You can walk up to a broken limb and just say, be healed. I don't got to counsel an injury. I don't got to counsel somebody through a demon. I can just look at it with the power of Jesus and say, get out in the name of Jesus. And if I really believe it, I don't have to feel it, but if I believe it, it will have to come to pass. I'm sick of super long prayers about things. Jesus would just walk by and be like, get out, dude. I'm on my way. Jesus is so powerful, I'm on my way to heal a little girl. I'm about to raise her from the dead. Jesus is so powerful that a lady walked up to him and just grabbed him by the hem of his garment, and she was healed. Peter would walk around, and people would get healed in his shadow, not because his shadow's fancy, because the Holy Ghost overshadows him. Oh, I want to be so overshadowed by the Holy Spirit of God. That power just exudes from me, from me, from the inside out. I don't got to counsel stuff. If you want counseling, go to a counselor, go to a therapist. If you want power, come to a man or woman of God who actually believes Jesus is alive and the Holy Spirit is working today, and you can be delivered. You can be delivered. You still might need to get your thinking right, but that core issue can be gone in the name of Jesus. His promises are for you today, my friends. He promises you life. He promises you resurrection. He promises you healing.